Okay, today I thought I would have a look at a piece I have, well, I've kind of semi written it. This is from a couple of months ago, and um, I, I didn't finish it, but I do think there's some interesting stuff in it. And I think maybe it's more useful to sort of go through it and then sort of talk around it. Somewhat similar to what I did on a recent video uh, about punk rock. Anyway, this one is about parasocial relationships. <clears throat> and um, it's really just a little bit about the history of that <clears throat> as a phenomena. And um, I mean, where I started with this is I was going to talk about sort of, you know, the 1960s and, uh, you know, how they, they this kind of information was sort of uh, internalized by the elites or you know, whatever you want to call these people, the likes of Tavistock. And then, you know, used and it absolutely was. But I think it's that's a little bit kind of obvious. And um, where I do think it's <laughs> more relevant is uh, on sort of, you know, phenomena such as the distant right where it's very much in effect, um, very much evident. Anyway, um, hopefully it's relatively interesting if you like this kind of thing. So uh, let's just get into it. So I'll just start with, <clears throat> <clears throat> still coughing. So yeah, please do excuse me on that. Uh, in 1956, behavioral psychologists Donald Horton and Richard Vole published what would become their seminal paper Mass Communication and Parasocial Interaction, Observations on Intimacy at a Distance. In this, they noted that the nascent technology of television created a then unique manner of interaction between the viewer and the media personalities being beamed into their living rooms. One of the striking characteristics of the new mass media, radio, television and the movies, oh sorry, this is a quote, this bit. So, quote, one of the striking characteristics of the new mass media, radio, television and the movies, is that they give the illusion of face-to-face -face relationship with the performer. The conditions of response to the performer are analogous to those in the primary group. The most remote and illustrious men are met as if they are in the circle of one's peers. The same is true of a character in a story who comes to life in these media in an especially vivid and arresting way. <clears throat> we propose to call this seeming face-to-face -face relationship between the spectator and performer a parasocial relationship." End quote. So, I mean, that's from the original paper by Horton and Vole. <clears throat> and they, they, the, the writing, I don't know, it's a little bit of its time, isn't it? Anyway, I'll continue. Uh, the unique aspect of this new phenomena was the one-sided nature of the relationship. The communication was directed purely towards the viewer, who could form an entirely unreciprocated internal relationship with the figure who would remain oblivious of the subject's existence. They identified key factors in the building of such a relationship. One the frequency of exposure, two, the personal nature of the content, three, the, pers the perceived accessibility of the media figure, whom they referred to as the persona, as they will be referred to from this point on. Uh, yeah, the personal nature of the content is an interesting one, isn't it? That's a key factor in building the relationship, the personal nature of the content. Um, that's particularly interesting, I think, with, with certain figures on the, the distant right amongst, and then I'm using the distant right as an example. I'm sure there are similar, similar groups, you know, I suppose there's a distant left somewhere, I don't know, or, you know, whatever the equivalent will be. I just, uh, well, I'm, I've kind of read these people a few times, so I'm using them as an example. I'll continue. They concluded that these figures can become surrogate companions for the viewer, influencing their behavior, emotions, and ultimately thoughts noting that the relationship served various psychological functions for the viewer. Yeah, that's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> but there you go. This was especially true. Oh, this is, yeah. This was especially true of those who were isolated, lonely, or in some degree of emotional distress. Now, that is interesting, isn't it? This is in 1956 that this kind of uh, report was written. I mean, this isn't from the report. This is regurgitating it. But... You know, they targeted that people who were isolated, lonely, or in some degree of emotional success, distress were, you know, especially kind of vulnerable to this. Well, you know, isn't that just uh, kind of emblematic of a lot of, well, it's just a lot of people today, really. Certainly since the events of 2020 and a number of others and just the sort of fragmentalized uh, society that we've morphed into. And I think, you know, the elites, as it were, you're going to call them that they have a vested interest in keeping people isolated lonely and in some degree of emotional distress so it's interesting that this was kind of picked up on in 56 you know 
and the, the, it be someone in this condition would be susceptible to parasocial relationships with ultimately controlled figures. Now, this is if we're talking about the sort of like the elites kind of people rather than some weird fringe online groups. You know, they they control these figures. I mean, think about Andrew Tate, if you want to put it in modern terms. He's absolutely one of these guys, nailed on. And he will, you know, it's a, it, it is a parasocial relationship which he forms with his, you know, lost sheep uh, followers. You know, it's really quite dark, isn't it? You know, they, they, they try and get people when they're down, basically. Anyway, I'll continue. They would form a bond with the persona, be he a talk show host, news anchor, or sports reporter. Again, this is from the 1956 vernacular. Quote, the persona is the typical and indigenous figure of the social scene presented by radio and television. To say that he is familiar and intimate is to use pale and feeble language for the pervasiveness and closeness with which multitudes feel his presence. Again, you know, it's just the language they use. The spectacular fact about such persona, or personae, is that they claim and achieve an intimacy with what are literally crowds of strangers. And this intimacy, even if it is an imitation and a shadow of what is ordinarily meant by the word, is extremely influential with and satisfying for the great numbers who willingly receive it and share in it. End quote. So it's very, like, it's just needs editing, <laughs> but whatever. Um, I'll continue. Um, bum, 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 bum. They know such a persona in the same way that they know their chosen friends, through direct observation and interpretation of his appearance, his gestures and voice, his conversation and conduct in a variety of situations. Indeed, those who make up his audience are invited, by designed informality, to make precisely these evaluations, to consider that they are involved in a face-to-face -face exchange rather than in passive ob observation. But the persona's image, while partial, contrived and penetrated by illusion, is no fantasy or dream. His performance is an objectively perceptible action in which the viewer is implicated imaginatively, but which he does not imagine. Oof. Oh, there you go. Which the viewer is implicated imaginatively, but which he does not imagine. Ah, you know, whatever. I think that's fairly clear, though, right? Apart from that last sentence. You know, the, 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 this, the, the persona, you know, their favourite sports reporter or whoever it would have been, you know, it does become like a surrogate kind of like, uh, you know, friend in their head. You know, and they, they think, oh, yeah, I'd like to have a beer with Ted and talk about the, uh, you know, the football or whatever it could be. You know, and, and they, they kind of start to take on mannerisms and, you know, all the rest of it. So we can already see that as far back as 1956, behavioral psychologists were keenly aware of the phenomenal social engineering and influencing tool that a controlled public persona could yield. Uh, repeat quote, apparently. And this intimacy is extremely influential with and satisfying for great numbers of people who willingly receive and share it, end quote. It is ultimately supposition, but given how pivotal this paper was regarded, it's unfathomable that it would not have greatly influenced or even sparked what could have become uh, what would become the counterculture operation of the following decade. Yeah, I mean, you know, they read this and they realised, you know, okay, pop stars can be these parasocial uh, figures, you know, and people like John Lennon and, you know, all the rest of them. You know, you can control, if you have a controlled figure and this controlled figure has parasocial relations with people, you know, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of influence and what they wanted to do with that generation... Well, they obviously, they, they, you know, this is, this is Tavistock 101. This is literal social science stuff, you know. This is what they are. They are social scientists. So they would have been all over this paper, all over it. So I think they absolutely, they would have used it for their aims. Um, anyway, I continue. What you have to remember is that this is from the vantage point of 1956. This same phenomenon happens today, I would argue, in a grossly accelerated fashion. Through the distorted lens of social media, constant access to any number of on-demand personalised media, all from a personal phone, with the levels of false social intimacy between the persona and the mark cranked up beyond all measure. I say the mark, you know what I mean, the viewer. Now the persona can actually interact, even bestow a like, a follow, a retweet or a comment upon the mark. This blurs the lines of a parasocial relationship even further for the viewer. 
now he can quite justifiably believe that he does actually have a form of relationship with the persona, when all he's indulging in is the willful delusion of accepting a cheap technologically rendered facsimile of social interaction and quite possibly friendship. Yeah, and I mean, you know, again, just using the dissident right as an example, you can see this all over. Like their whole little, their whole little uh, ecosystem is based on this. Some figures more than others, but absolutely, you know. And it is, it is this little fucking fake mate simulator. I mean, I think I said that in an old video. It is, a, it's like a friend simulator. It's, it's really, it's not good because ultimately, if you're kind of indulging in that any kind of parasocial relationship, but especially if it's like, you know, interacting with people on Twitter and thinking, you know, <laughs> they're your pal. It's kind of scratching an itch for you. Now, if you are some sort of slightly fragmented, kind of like lonely or in some degree of emotional distress character, well, you kind of need friends or you at least need some sort of level of companionship or you need some level of community. And if you're just kind of getting this kind of, uh, you're scratching this itch via your telephone and via like Substack articles, which you pay in order to, <laughs> which you pay for so you can like comment on their blog and they can like your comment. I mean, you know, I don't think that's healthy. I think they'd be better off, you know, getting out and about and, you know, as I said, like go and train, train boxing or play some team sports. You know, even if you even oh, I don't like football, whatever. You find some team sport and go and play that. Go and practice that. You'll get some mates. Might get fit, you know. Or just do this. Do what you want. I don't care. Um, anyway, quote, The persona offers, above all, a continuing relationship. His appearance is regular and dependable event to be counted on, planned for, and integrated into the routines of daily life. Yeah, well, I mean, it is in the routines of daily life, you know, and again, using it as an example of these dissident right people, you know, I mean, it's what they do, isn't it? They wake up and they check their phone and they read the comments and they tweet and they like and they, you know, it's all, this is their routine. You know, beyond what it was in 1956, where like maybe twice a week they, they you know, had their favourite news anchor and they thought he was a good American guy or whatever it would have been, you know. You know, now it is really, it's, it's, you know, amps up to 11, you know, on all of this stuff. Anyway, continue. His devotees live with him and share the small episodes of his public life. <laughs> and to some extent, even his private life away from the show. Again, this to them right. Certain figures. Bit of a soap opera, isn't it? You know, it's this fake intimacy. They know what they're doing. I don't think they've, I want to be clear here. I don't think they went and brushed up on parasocial relationships and then implemented it. I think they just, but they absolutely know what they're doing. In fact, there's a really grotty uh, case. Oh, I remember someone, I saw this on a video. Like I saw someone discuss it on a video. It's Mark Collette, uh, a repulsive little man, and uh, his little uh, crew of shysters. But they, um, apparently, there's some very confused individual when I say confused, they're confused about the fabric of their identity, as it were. Uh, you know, they might, they might have switched. And uh, this, this individual, apparently, clearly is not all there, clearly is a mental health case. Mentally ill, I would suggest. But um, based Mark, who, who talks a lot about this stuff, he's not averse to taking money from it, you know what I mean? He, and apparently this individual sends them reasonably reasonably large amounts of donations, like super chats with like, I don't know, $200 or whatever. And Mark, he's always keen to read, I don't know, I don't know his name, but, oh, hello, Maisie, oh, lovely to hear from you. Oh, great, oh, we really appreciate it. You know, always good to hear you're, you're watching. It's just, oh, it's so creepy. It's disgusting. It's parasitical. You, you're like poncing off this very confused individual and you, 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 you I mean not only that but you're kind of mugging it off as well like you know what I mean it's bad enough you're taking the money but it's ugh. anyway I'll continue um, indeed their continued association with him acquires a history and the accumulation of shared past experiences give additional meaning to the present performance this bond is symbolized by illusions that lack meaning for the casual observer and appear occult to the outsider. That's their word, occult, uh, you know, hidden to the outsider. 
In time, the devotee, the fan, comes to believe that he, quote, knows the persona more intimately and profoundly than others do, that he understands his character and appreciates his values and motives. Such an accumulation of knowledge and intensification of loyalty, however, appears to be a kind of growth without development, for the one-sided nature of the connection precludes a progressive and mutual reformulation of its values and aims. Yeah, well, I mean, it's deeply, deeply unhealthy, isn't it? I mean, you know, and uh, this is just around the music industry. You really see this. If you go on any YouTube channel, as I often sort of do, like looking for like little bits I can chop up and stuff. And I'll look at videos about John Lydon, or I'll look at videos about, I mean, the Beatles is all over it. You've got these, like, the people who, rep who reply, you know, the box, set, the box set sniffers, as it were. You know, these are people who are probably in their mid to late 70s at this point, or, you know, whatever. They're getting on, 60 plus, the punks or whatever. And they've been in parasocial relationships with these characters for, like, you know, whew, well, a long time, 50 years in some instances, maybe even more. And the way they talk about it, the way they, oh, that's just so typical of John, ha, 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 ha. Well, you know, John wasn't like that at all. No, you've got him wrong. It is it's exactly like this. It's exactly like this. Yeah, you know, it's not healthy, is it? If you spent your life in a parasocial relationship with uh, a Luciferian, <laughs> John Lennon. I mean, uh, you know, it's not gonna do you any favors, is it? I mean, I suppose it's probably worse now when you've got people like, as I say, like Andrew Tate and, you know, God knows who else. Anyway, I will continue. The persona may be considered by his audience as a friend, counsellor... Oh, hang on, I haven't read this bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. The persona may be considered by his friend as a counsellor... Uh, as a friend, counsellor, comforter and a role model. God help them if they think the dissident rights are role models, but there we go. Uh, but unlike real associates, he has the peculiar virtue of being standardised according to the formula for his character and performance, which he and his managers have planned and embodied in an appropriate production format. Thus, his character and pattern of action remain basically unchanged in a world of otherwise disturbing change. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, again, it's just like if you've got, if you're in this fragmented kind of inverted commas relationship with people on the internet yeah I mean that's probably not going to change every Sunday you'll watch so and so's stream and it's a bit like an old friend dropping around for tea I mean that's really quite sad genuinely like you know tragic really isn't it you know, oh Sunday 7 o'clock you know and they sit there and they like fire off super chats to these figures because they want, you know, they, they want to get some, some degree of recognition and form some kind of bond with them. And that is exactly what it is. You know, I, maybe, maybe I'm being overly harsh, but this is really what it is with a lot of these people. I mean, Millennial Woes is one guy. <laughs> he has, like, he does this yearly kind of uh, telethon event, streaming marathon. And... I mean, he, he has one stream, which I think is on Christmas Day or Boxing Day or something, and he he spends two hours opening his... He's got a P.O. Box number, and people send him Christmas cards, <laughs> some of which contain poems. And I mean, I just don't know what's happening. Like, what, what the fuck are you doing? I mean, they're sending Christmas cards, someone with 20 quid in it and stuff. Like, I mean, fucking give him... Do what you want. Like, if you want to send him a Christmas card and 20 quid in it. But I, I would suggest don't write poems for other men, <laughs> generally. As a rule of thumb, call me old-fashioned. That's, that's a bit dodgy. Like, I don't know who these people are that are writing poems, but this isn't right figures. He didn't read out the poem, because <laughs> I did skim this thing. I'm not actually sure. Maybe it was that, or it was on his appearance with Morgoth. Someone sort of sent a super chat containing a poem. And he said, oh, oh, thanks very much. Well, I won't read this now. And I thought, fucking hell. What's in these poems? But, uh, you know, what are people doing writing poems for men on the internet? I mean, aside from the slightly dodgy aspect there, I mean, what's, what's the headspace? They're obviously trying to get an emotional reaction from their parasocial relationship figure. So they're trying to kind of connect with them. 
<laughs> Fucking hell. Oh, I'll write him a poem. Jesus. Oh dear, what's wrong with people? Anyway, um, bu- 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 so let's continue. Okay, well, this is just the, the conclusion that I wrote. Um, so there's two ways to take this information. Firstly, from a historical vantage point, we can see how this highly influential sociological paper would have been manna from secular heaven for the likes of Tavistock. Bearing in mind this is 1956 and the popular music industry was still very much in its infancy, one could see how they might have observed, observed its potential before making plans on utilising it in the coming years. The parasocial relationships that the boomers would have had for their Tavistockian pop idols yielded an unprecedented degree of societal control. Surely this was at the core of the whole operation. And if we look to the Beatles, they, why they were selected for the role. In George Martin's own words, he thought their music was poor and that they had no songs, but he liked their personalities and found them engaging. I would argue this was his remit. He was presented with four charismatic and engaging figures and then tasked with coordinating and producing a seemingly organic musical legacy from them. If you want to write this off as simple pop star infatuation that people grow out of, I suggest watching any content today from standard boomer rock fans. Look at videos, clips of interviews, performances, etc. You will find presumably nigh-on octogenarians still wholly enthralled to a 60-year-old parasocial relationship with their, her- with their heroes, be they dead or alive. They talk about them as if they were old friends, even though the, the rock stars in question would never have known them from Adam. Yet they recall every last detail of their heroes' lives, at least the official narrative that was presented to them, via various sources from the media. This should all be pretty clear, at least to anyone who's been wading in the counterculture psyop water for any amount of time. What's arguably more interesting is how this has morphed with the tech and social media age and the prevalence of this phenomena even in relatively organic areas of modern online life. To examine this, we can look at what has become the wider dissident right. When we look at this scene, in Britain at least, I believe its inception was broadly organic. I do not believe that any of the major figures, Mark Collette apart, were premeditated in their role. I believe they were genuine, at the very least in their beginnings. Nor do I believe that any of them would have been conscious of their role in the parasocial relationships that some of their followers would have grown to have with them. Um, well, I'm not sure I agree with that <laughs> that last bit, but anyway, okay. However, I believe that implicitly they have come to understand the broader concept and have learned to play the game for financial reward and status. So there you go. Um, that's basically it in a nutshell. As I say, I really think, just again looking at the dissident right, I mean, these, these figures, um, <laughs> it's, it's based on parasocial relationships. Because they all, I think this is maybe five or six years ago. I don't know when it was actually. I think, was it post COVID? I kind of tapped out around COVID because I kind of thought COVID kind of blindsided them. And I just thought it showed that they were just on the wrong track. And, you know, from that point on, I just thought, well, they're not really, <laughs> they're not really worth listening to or giving that much focus. However, I, I did kind of listen to a few of them, so I'm not sure when they really started to go fully kind of monetized. But I think it was around then. And, um, I mean, the monetized aspect, that is where the parasocial relationship comes into it. Like, if they're not taking money, then I really don't think there's... I don't think they build it. Because here's the thing, like, the guys that give them money, the guys that subscribe to them and, and bung them 20 quid or whatever here and there, you know, I'm talking about the organic guys rather than any other slightly more dubious sources we can speculate about. But, you know, th- these these are people, they, they kind of implicitly know that they are buying a product. When they're giving these people money, they're getting a leg up in the parasocial relationship. So it means that if they're like a regular and they send them messages, oh, well done, I love that, oh, here's John, you know, 117821, or whatever his username is, they know they're, they're buying something from these figures and now they're going to get likes and they're going to get maybe retweets and they're going to get like replies because they're playing the game and like you're kidding yourself on if you don't think that happens. <laughs> I mean, there's one guy, Morgoth. I don't know, it's just, I think he's kind of like the king of it. I really think he's got legions of these guys that are in a parasocial relationship with him. And it's just fucking, I don't know, it's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, I've seen like a couple of his videos and I've noticed a pattern of like it, people presenting anecdotes of their own tears to him. 
in response to his content. And it's just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> just, I don't know, they're like, oh, I don't mind telling you, Morgoth. The tears are rolling down my face as I listen to this. I don't mind telling you I'm welling up, Morgoth. <laughs> it's like numerous times. Maybe I'll dig it out. I'll look, look for the comments and I'll put them on the screen. But these people are kind of like reporting anecdotes of their tears to him. <laughs> like presenting them like, I don't know, like a cat does to a wounded sparrow. Like brings in a wounded sparrow and puts it across the front door. That's kind of what they're doing with anecdotes of their own tears. Oh, you touch the innermost depths of my soul with your words. Oh, how the people will live on. And it's just, it's so maudling. It's just fucking weird. Like firstly... Gain whatever, I don't know, maybe old fashioned, don't cry. If you're a man, don't cry. Like, as a rule of thumb. Now, if your mum dies or if your dog gets run over, you're well within your rights to cry about it. You know, but if if you were talking about like watching some depressing video that a guy's made, you know, on the internet, you really shouldn't be crying. Now I know a lot of people say, Oh well, fuck you, he's just like he's touching these people with uh, they're so like troubled by the you know, future of their people. Well, yeah, okay, but don't fucking cry. That's just such a weak re reaction. If this is the case and it's just like, no, you just oh you've got no emotion for your people. Uh. No, it's just that you shouldn't sit there and cry. You shouldn't be maudling. And I really don't think the British are a maudling people. I don't think that's in our character as a people. Now, <laughs> I think it's kind of in the Irish character a little bit. And you can see this in, uh, you know, Liverpool to an extent. I think there is a, a certain culture of sort of this maudling kind of uh, sentimentality. And I really don't think it's very healthy. And I really don't think, I don't, when I think about the English character and the Scottish character, and I suspect the, the Welsh character as well, I don't think we're a maudling people. I think we're a sort of get up and go kind of people. We're a fucking dust yourself down and fucking have at it kind of people. And I don't think sitting on your sofa, listening to some video, some morose video on the internet and like crying about it, I just think it's, it's an awful, <laughs> it's an awful reaction. Do something, you know, or just find something that kind of lifts your spirits because if you are genuinely crying about stuff on the internet as a man um well I, I really think you should be looking for something that will lift your spirits because i think you're probably a little bit you know you, you're not in a good place and if you're not in a good place fine a lot of people aren't there's no 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 shame in that especially in these day and age but find something that'll lift your spirits don't find something which will kind of like you know drag you into this kind of like demoralized mindset it's not going to do you any favors Anyway, there you go. So I hope this has been, you know, at least somewhat interesting. You know, I don't, I don't know if it's effective to sort of like read, read around pieces of half written or it's just incredibly lazy. But sometimes I think I read them and then I kind of think, well, I just want to sort of, you know, talk about it a little bit, flesh it out a little bit. And um, I don't know, maybe I'm just being lazy. <laughs> but, you know, as ever, take it or leave it. And uh, I wish you a good day. Hello and welcome to the 2023 Christmas card stream. I should say that we obviously did this last year. Some of you will know that, some of you won't. And it was a unique idea last year. I wasn't sure whether it would work, but it turned out to be a very good idea. Uh, it worked out very well. Lots of people enjoyed it. Uh, and it was also a new way <coughs> for people to send in you know, their, their support, their donations, without using uh, online uh, methods and uh, you know the, the old-fashioned way but also it was a way to do something old-fashioned to have Christmas cards that would be shown on screen 
Now, and so we're doing exactly the same this year. I set up a PO box so that this could happen, and uh, we're now going to do exactly the same thing. All right. Here we go. So this is the first one. It's rather a large envelope, um, and it's from uh, Ireland. I think I can show you that. There we go. All right. Let's see. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. What's this? Um, uh, <laughs> this is lovely. Someone's actually painted a, a picture of me in, in London and there's Telegram there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How adorable. Uh, that's lovely. Um, and there's a, I think I meant to push this. Hold on. Uh, I meant to do something here. Hold on, let me see. Uh, I've written a message on inside. Oh, flip the switch. Right, so how do I do that? Ah, oh, there we go. It's got lights on it. <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, that's adorable. Thank you so much. That's just lovely. Um, okay, I will read this message. Okay, Merry Christmas, Woes. Here's to another... All right, I'm, I'll read this whole message. I'm just checking it so that I, I know whether it's safe to uh, to have on screen. I think it is. Um, okay, Merry Christmas, Woes. Here's to another millennial, a wonderful tradition. Looking forward to getting cosy with Woesy. Thank you. See, this was obviously written before millennials started, so it's, it's quite funny to take ourselves back to, uh, to that moment. Um, thank you for your bravery in putting yourself out there, and thank you for your everlasting good humour. Love from Ireland. And kudos from one disillusioned former art student to another. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, then he's got a rather extensive story about a fish and a bicycle, uh, which presumably is referencing the feminist thing. But I will read that later. I won't read that entire story out just now. But thank you very much. This is from a, a disgruntled, disillusioned former art student. That's just a, a lovely thing. Thank you very much.